Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. There are many people outside of this church, people that we love, that we care about, people that we see every day. There are people that we work with and play with and do business with who do not know Jesus Christ. They've heard about him. They recognize his name. They're aware of the impact that he's had on history, but they don't know him. They know religion. They know church. They know denominationalism. They know traditionalism, but they have never surrendered their life to God, and they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. The question that hits me every day is, what are we doing about it? We can't content ourselves to sit in the church and unlock the doors and hope that someday they'll come to Christ on their own. But God has told us that we have to go to them. We have to go to them. We, we have to live Jesus in front of them so they see no, something in us that they don't see in themselves. They have to see something in us that is not of us and not of this world. They have to see through us what the power of God can do. So that means we can't be like everybody else. We can't afford for our message to get lost in our lack of holiness. We can't afford for our message to get lost in hypocrisy and carnality. But we have to be like Jesus in every way, the way we act, the way we talk, and the way we walk. We have to tell them about a Savior who can change their life and then be living proof that he is able to do it because he did it for us. And then we have to be persistent enough to never stop witnessing unto them until they come to know him too. When was the last time you told somebody about Jesus? When was the last time you knelt next to someone and prayed a salvation prayer? God says you hold the keys to the kingdom of God. You decide who goes in and you decide who stays out. But I want to ask you this morning, are you welcoming people into the kingdom or are you blocking the entrance? In the scriptures, God would always send his prophets to warn people to repent because judgment was coming. Judgment was coming because of their sin. No other prophets carried that message. All of the other prophets would tell people that their life was good and that God was satisfied. But God's prophets were different. Now, if you haven't discovered by now, we are different than other churches. Now, we're not weird. I mean, we don't jump over pews or handle snakes or go into trances and see things that's not there. Uh, We don't drink Kool-Aid or sell flowers at the airport. But we're not your typical run-of-the-mill church. We are different than the norm with a capital D. At Easter time, when many churches are holding egg hunts and taking pictures with the Easter bunny, we're taking people on a journey through time, and we're telling them about the blood of God's Son, the crucifixion, and the resurrection, and then inviting them to surrender their life to God. There are more people in our vacation Bible school than there are in our public school system. Even though we sit in the middle of a cornfield in a rural community, our message is reaching multiple thousands of people worldwide every week, and we are doing mission work all over the globe. Only God could do that from this place. Ever since our inception in 1986, we have broken nearly every rule that there is for growing a church. If somebody wrote a book, here's how you grow a church, we'd have to throw it away. We're not in a large community. We're not in an area of growth where factories and schools are being built. One of our out-of-town contractors that worked on this new building said to me one day, he said, where do all of the people come from that go to this church? When I turned off of the highway, I didn't see one soul till I got here. And yet God continues to bless here. People are finding God here. There were 40 kids saved during our Bible school. 40 kids Last Sunday, we baptized 36 people, and some of them were saved just before they stepped into the water. 
Marriages are being fixed, families are being brought together, relationships are being healed, and those in bondage are being set free. And then to top it all off, last night at Storm, over 100 people came forward during the invitation, and dozens of teenagers accepted Christ as their Savior. God is working here. But we don't fit the mold of what the world is defined to be. And some people don't know what to make of that. There is an intensity here, an aggressiveness and a boldness that's often refreshing, but can sometimes be intimidating. This isn't always the most comfortable place to attend. If you're looking for comfort, you need to go to the Lazy Boy store. There's a spirit here that confronts sin in a day and age when, we're, when the subject of sin has become off limits. We still call sin out for what it is. And we challenge those who have no relationship with God to repent of their sin and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. There's a conviction that challenges born-again believers to move closer to God, to separate from the worldliness and to step into holiness. There's a confrontation here that challenges God's people to rise up in ministry and to do the work of God's kingdom. There is never a service where the Spirit of God doesn't move. There is never a service where the plain truth of the gospel isn't preached. There's never a service here where God is not magnified and Jesus Christ is not glorified. And there are some good people who can't handle that. Let's just tell the truth. Can we be honest for a minute? There are some who have to get away every now and then and regroup. They have to miss a couple of Sundays so they can let the conviction pass and their conscience clear before they can come back inside. And then there are others who just can't take it at all, who just run away and find some place that tells them something easier to hear. Ecclesiastes 3 says, there is a time for everything. God has put enough hours in our day and enough days in our life to expose us to the gamut of life's experiences and emotions, and he intends for us to experience them. God says there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. There's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh, to mourn and to dance, to scatter stones and gather stones, to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Some people want to attend a church where they leave every Sunday morning feeling good. They want a church where the pastor always preaches about happy things and positive experiences. They want to hear how they can be blessed and how God will heal their sickness and provide for their wants and keep them safe from the enemy. They want a church where they can get help and healing and then get heaven when they die. They want a church that doesn't acknowledge sin, where there's no conviction and they don't have to repent and change their ways, but instead they can just take God by one hand and still hold on to the world with the other. They want a church where they have no responsibility But all they have to do is to go to Bible studies and have picnics and attend concerts. They have taken God's description of life from Ecclesiastes 3, and they have removed the difficult things. They remove the emotions and the experiences of their life that they don't want to deal with. They have taken out of life what God said is a natural part of this life. So their description of life is there's a time to be born and to plant and to heal and build and laugh and dance and gather stones and embrace and to search and mend and speak and love and time for peace. That sounds wonderful. If we always had our own way, it's what all of us would desire for our life to be. But that's not the word of God, and it's not what God told us life is. If you have cancer, you can find a doctor out there somewhere who will tell you that you don't have cancer. And you can leave his office feeling pretty happy, but you're still going to die later. If you have blockages in your heart and you need a bypass surgery, you can probably find a doctor out there who will tell you, just take this little pill and and you'll do okay. And you're going to walk out of his office feeling better about your situation. But if you want to get well, you're not listening. If you want to get well, 
You're going to find a doctor who's going to deal with your problem. You're going to find a doctor who will tell you the truth and offer to you a real cure. If you want to live with somebody without marrying them and commit adultery, you can go to a church where the pastor doesn't mention it. If you choose to practice homosexuality, you can find a church where the preacher won't preach about it. If you choose to live in sin, you can find a church where the Sunday sermon never mentions it. But I want you to know, if you want to get well, if you want to get called church, if you want to get well, you're going to find a church that will deal with your problem and a pastor who will tell you the truth and proclaim the blood of Jesus Christ that will fix your problem once and for all and give you life everlasting. If you're in a church that always makes you feel good, then you're in a church that isn't doing you any good. Some people just want a duck dynasty. They want to leave church every Sunday morning feeling happy, happy, happy. There's Sundays when you walk out of here stepping on the clouds. The Spirit of God has moved. You've been blessed. You're singing praises, shouting amen. Last Sunday was one of those kind of services. I, I told my wife, I said, I think that might have been the best service we've ever had in the history of this church. And we all left here feeling good. Two Sundays ago was our Bible school program. And it was an awesome Sunday service. We all left here tired, but we were feeling good. But God doesn't intend for church to be that way all the time. When you leave church on Sunday morning, you shouldn't always feel good. Some Sundays you should leave church feeling bad because there's work that still isn't finished and souls that aren't saved and churches that are uh, still not built and missions that are still in need of help and you know that you have more to do. Some Sundays you should leave the church feeling sad because there's still millions who are sick and starving and enslaved by sin and you know that it won't get done without your help. Some Sundays you ought to leave the church mad because the sermon has stepped on your toes and the Holy Spirit has convicted you and you know that you need to make some serious changes in your life, but you should never leave church every Sunday feeling good. If you leave church feeling good every Sunday, then you must be convinced that you've already arrived. You must believe that you're already Christ-like in all your ways. And instead of saying to people, what would Jesus do? You just say, what would I do? Instead of a cross and a Jesus fish on the bump of your car, you just have a little picture of your face that says, repent and follow me. If you leave church feeling good every Sunday, then you must be convinced that your work on this earth is finished. You must believe that the kingdom of God has already come and the planet's ready for Christ's return. Everybody that you know must be saved. Every starving child must be fed. All of the sick and dying must be healed. Every prisoner must be set free. But we know better than that, don't we, church? If you're in a church that always makes you feel good, then you might be in a church that isn't doing any good. But that's what some people want. They want to believe that they have it all together, and they don't want anybody to mess that up, so they cluster. They surround themselves with other so-called Christians who live just like they do. They flatter each other and assure each other that they're living in God's favor, even though they know that they're not. They avoid the preaching of the Word. They hold Bible studies, but they only study topics that are relevant to their cause, and they use the Scriptures to justify the way they're living. Their pastor might preach from the Bible, but he's not preaching God's Word for the day. When he's finished preaching, he doesn't give an altar call because there is no altar. He doesn't want people to feel uncomfortable or conspicuous. But he must have forgotten uh, that, that when John the Baptist preached the gospel, he didn't tell those who uh, would believe to slip off after the service and meet him behind a rock or a tree. But John challenged them to publicly step out of the crowd and into the Jordan River to be baptized. It's become the end thing among people today to have a Christianity that fits well with the world. It is acceptable to have a faith that embraces the sinner and his or her sin instead of trying to save the sinner from their sin. Those who preach against sin and encourage repentance are labeled as troublemakers, while those who preach lighter things are elevated as heroes of the faith. They are pastors with which carnal Christians can relate. I'll be the first to tell you that we don't have comfort zones here. We have no place where you can sit idle and stew. We have no place where you can relax and marinate in your past experiences because we're convinced that God always has something better. 
There's always a better relationship. There was always a closer walk. There's always a deeper commitment. There's always a greater infilling and a better testimony than what you have right now. You have not yet arrived. I've not yet arrived, but we are all being perfected and conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. This isn't heaven. It's pretty nice, but it's not heaven. You didn't pass through a set of pearly gates to get in here today. You just walked through some glass doors. You didn't shake St. Peter's hand. You just shook the hand of a greeter or an usher. And there isn't one here who can honestly say that they're like Jesus in all their ways. There isn't one here who is perfect. There isn't one here who doesn't struggle daily with sin and our own mortality. There isn't one of us here who has arrived. But we are all but flesh and bone made from the dust of the earth and we house the Holy Spirit of our perfect God and there is always room for improvement. There's always room. Always room. One of the greatest spiritual problems that we face today is that some people have an agenda of the flesh that stands in opposition to the agenda that God has for the life. The agenda of the flesh says, I'm too busy. I'm still working on my career. I'm still working on my finances. The agenda of the flesh says, I'm still young and I want to do other things with my life. The agenda of the flesh says, I'm good enough the way I am and I don't need to be perfect. I don't need to be sinless. I was thinking this morning that there are people in the Bible that we don't read about. The people that didn't go to the upper room because there was a ball game that day. The people that that didn't go out into the wilderness to hear Jesus preach because it was hot and the sun was unbearable and they weren't going to set out in that just to hear some guy preach. The people who we don't read about. But they're people who follow the agenda of the flesh. Now, there's nothing wrong with setting goals and pursuing a career and working to make a better life for you and your family. You ought to be doing that. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the fruits of your labor because God's Word encourages you to do that. There's nothing wrong with getting involved in your community and in your school. There's nothing wrong with coaching a ball team or helping the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts until those things begin to interfere with the agenda that God has for your life. When the agenda of the flesh supersedes the agenda of the Spirit of God is when we get in trouble. Some people want to church, want to come to church when they come to church and be comfortable. They're tired from all of the other things that they're involved in, and they come to church on Sunday morning to rest and get recharged for the week of other things that lies ahead. They want to relax and do little or nothing, but just sit there and get filled up. So when they sit under a Sunday sermon that challenges them, when the conviction of the Holy Spirit becomes too strong, and God presents them with an ultimatum, they slip away, and they sometimes never come back. I learned a long time ago, I can't make anybody serve God. I've wasted a lot of good energy and a lot of good days chasing down people who didn't want to serve God. I've begged them to come to church and to live for God, but I've learned that if somebody doesn't have enough of God in them to make them want to serve Him, there isn't anything I can do about it. Don't choose a church on the basis of whether it pleases you, but choose a church on the basis of whether it pleases God. We have many tremendous workers here. I'm so proud of your efforts over this past month. You have to be tired. We have people who can pray at a moment's notice. We have people who can teach a Sunday school lesson, run kids' programs, and sing songs and play instruments. We have people who are gifted, that can fix things that are broken, people who can prepare a meal for four or 500 people and do it, then do it again about three hours later. We have people who spend hours doing ministries that the majority of us never see. But the problem that we sometimes face has nothing to do with dedication. It has nothing to do with how much time we spend or how hard we work, but the problem that we sometimes encounter is the numbness that sets in when we get used to the presence of our great God. We get so used to hearing the Word of God preached and taught, so used to people getting saved and praying at the altar, so used to the challenge of the Holy Spirit on our heart that we can shake it off without a second thought. And then we no longer appreciate what we have. It becomes to us no longer any big deal. We take many things in our life for granted, and when we do those things, lose their value to us. We stop appreciating our husband for the godly man he is, or we stop appreciating our wife for the godly example that she is. We overlook the blessing that our children have been, or we lose our focus and overlook the many blessings that surround us every day, and those things begin to lose their value. 
In Luke chapter 7, the disciples went to eat with Jesus at the house of Simon the Pharisee. But before the meal, a woman, only known in the Scriptures as a sinner woman, came and knelt before Jesus and washed his feet. She washed him with her tears and dried him with her hair, and then she anointed his feet with an expensive ointment that she carried in an alabaster box. Simon the Pharisee questioned why Jesus would allow a sinner such as this woman to do something like that. But Simon missed the point, just like we sometimes miss the point. Jesus was the greatest guest that would ever cross his threshold, but Simon did none of those things for him. The disciples who were once impressed by Jesus' majesty, they had heard his preaching and they had seen his power and witnessed his miracles, but none of them knelt at his feet. They had got so used to him that his presence was no longer any big deal. When you begin taking God for granted, it's time that you kneel before his feet and worship him again. When you take him for granted how he's answered your prayers and supplied for your needs and how he's protected you and provided for you and healed you and helped you, when you forget, it's time that you drop back down on your knees and worship him. We see what we choose to see. My wife Lisa is a cleaning fanatic. Those of you who've been around here long enough know that. She lives to clean. She loves to clean. She actually enjoys it. Don't understand that? Now, me, on the other hand, I'm not dirty, but I'm not detailed. Unless it's a spot on my car. You know, I don't notice dirty socks in the middle of the floor, but I can spot a tar spot on my car fender 50 feet away. You guys know what I'm talking about. Lisa notices details. She sees dust. What kind of Superman x-ray vision do you have to have to be able to see dust? She would go, look, there's dust. I said, where? Over there on the shelf, in the corner behind that figurine. You know? What we choose to see or not to see tells a very accurate story of who we are. There are many levels of enlightenment among us here today. Many of you come from various church backgrounds and some from non-church backgrounds. And because of that, we have, all have varying degrees of Bible knowledge and Christian experience. Some of you are able to rattle off all of the books of the Bible, while others of you are still calling Job, Job, and Psalms, Palms, and you think that Malachi is where Jesus went to high school. Some of you attend Sunday school, Sunday night services, and Wednesday night, family night, because you can't get enough, while others have trouble just making it to worship on Sunday morning. Some of you read your Bible and pray every day, while others rarely spend any time with the Lord. And yet, with all of our differences, we still have a common problem, and that is our inability to see God as He truly is. No matter who we are or what our level of experience is, our vision of God is somewhat impaired. How many of you wear glasses or contact lenses? Let me see your hands. Wow. Can you see me? (laughs) Maybe we ought to have a healing service just for blind people here. Do you remember when your eyesight started to go and you had to wrestle with the fact that it was actually your eyesight? But you couldn't admit that your vision was going, could you? It was just too dark in the room. Got to do something about these lights or your arms aren't long enough. I hate buying new glasses because I don't want to spend the money. I'm kind of tight that way. So I try to make the ones that I wear, I'm wear i wearing last as long as I possibly can. And I refuse to admit that my eyesight is getting worse and I need to go buy a pair. Some of you heard this before. One day I was in Kohl's with my wife. And I was wandering through the, the men's clothing department. Now, you know how Kohl's is set up? Their aisles are like this wide, you know. And you just kind of squeeze through. Well, I was going through looking at the clearance stuff. And there was a guy coming at me from the other side. And I kept going in. I was farther in than he was. But he kept coming at me. And the more I go in, the more he'd come at me. And I thought, no, no, one of us is going to have to give some ground because we can't get through. He was a kind of a big, heavy set, you know, dumpy looking guy. And, and I was working my way up the aisle there. And he kept working his way toward me until I got maybe about seven or eight feet away. And I realized it was a full length mirror <laughs> on a post. And I went and bought new glasses. We tend to look at God through our own impaired vision, and we see only what time, circumstances, and experience allows us to see. We only see what we're willing to admit that we can or that we want to see. But God reveals himself to us as we are willing to open and open to know him. 
Our level of holiness and godliness is only what we seek for it to be. God will only show you as much of himself as you're willing to see. So the question of the day is, how close to God do you really want to be? The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, imperfection disappears. What he's telling us is that perfection is actually within our reach. Now, it might be very high and it might be very far away and seemingly inaccessible, but with God's help, we can still reach it. The Bible calls it holiness. In verse 12, he says, we now see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. In Paul's day, mirror quality was poor at best. A person could see his reflection, but he had great trouble seeing the details of his reflection. He often couldn't see in his reflection the details that other people could see plainly. But Paul says that's how most of us see God, and it's how we see God in ourselves. We openly admit that we're not perfect. We openly admit that we've not arrived and that we don't know everything, and yet we're convinced that we have a handle on who God is. And we're satisfied that God is satisfied with how we're living. There are many today with normal eyesight whose spiritual vision is impaired. They're convinced that they see all things clearly, but in reality they see very little of God. And because of this blindness, they become unwitting agents of Satan, not because they don't believe in God and not because they're living deep in sin, but because of what they are unable to see, a level of experience and a closeness to God that they don't have. That's why the same Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3.10, Oh, that I might know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that is rapidly becoming my favorite passage of Scripture. Like Paul, most Christians today would say, I want to know Christ. But what many people fail to realize is if they really want to see God and know God, there is a process of getting there. Paul said, I want to know the power of his resurrection. Hallelujah, what a great thing to know. We all want resurrection victory. But what we fail to realize is that we can't experience the power of a resurrection until we have had a death. God can't raise you from the dead until you become dead. There are many who profess to believe in God who want to walk out of the grave and wave to the cheering crowd as they're congratulated and celebrated for their victory, but they don't want to die to get there. But I'm here to tell you this morning, you have to die to get there. You have to die in more ways than one to get there. You not only have to die out to your sins, but you have to die out to your old life, and you have to die out to your old ways, and you have to die out to your old habits, and maybe even your old friends. You have to die out to this world. You have to come out of your hangouts and let go of your past and cling to God who will resurrect you to new life. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. But then Paul also says, I want to know him in the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. If you only want the benefits of Christianity without the sacrifice of Christianity, then you'll never really know God. How many of you want to suffer with Christ? That's what I thought. You see, that's a good cutting off point. That's a good line of distinction between those who really want to know Christ and those who just want to use him. It's a good line of distinction between those who think they see God and those who really want to see God. It's where worldliness is separated from holiness. Paul says, I want to share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Now, we all know how Jesus suffered, and we all know how Christ died. He was put through the most horrible ordeal imaginable and then crucified, one of the most terrible kinds of death that anybody could suffer. How many of us are willing to die the way Christ died? That has so much emphasis to what Paul said when he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. Paul was saying, every morning when I rise from my bed, the very first thing I do is crucify my cursed flesh so that it won't rain over me for that day. Every morning, I drive nails through my own hands and I drive nails through my own feet so that I'll be free to live only for God in righteousness. Every day of my life, I'm willing to put myself through the torture and the torment and the pain of crucifying my flesh so that I can live for him. That doesn't sound like the popular Christianity of our day, does it? It doesn't sound like blessings and benefits and pleasure, but it sounds like agony and sacrifice. You can only make a commitment like that that, that when you really know who God is. You can only make that kind of commitment when you truly believe in the sovereignty of God. You can only make that kind of commitment when when you believe the Bible to be God's infallible word. You can only make that kind of commitment when you know the reality of heaven and the reality of hell. You can only make that kind of commitment 
when you know that whatever you have to endure in this life is going to be worth it someday. Oh, that I might know him. There's a closer walk with God than where you're walking. There's a deeper commitment and a better relationship than what you've experienced. So you can't stop. You can't stop. You can't relax and let down your guard. You can't rest on something that's happened in your past and think that you're set for eternity. But God says you have to press on toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In Revelation chapter 4, God spoke to the apostle John three amazing words. He said, John, come up higher. Come up higher. It was the apostle John who accomplished more and witnessed more and experienced more than all of us in this church put together. But God said to him, John, come up higher. I don't care who you are today, you have some climbing to do. There's still a mountain in front of you and a pinnacle for you to reach. Dig in your heels, get a good grip, pull yourself up to another level. Come up higher. But to get up higher, John had to first go lower. After faithfully walking and working with Jesus in ministry, John was taken prisoner and he was tortured for his faith. History says that he was boiled in oil. He was plunged head first into a boiling cauldron of oil, literally frying his skin on his body. But John survived the ordeal. It would have probably been better that he died. He was then banished to hard labor on a slave island, busting up rocks in the hot sun. I can only imagine the pain that he lived with every day. I would venture to say that John wasn't an inherent of a feel-good Christianity. But it was from there, it was from there in his pain and in his suffering that God gave to John the invitation, come up higher. When John stepped into the presence of God, he couldn't adequately describe in human terms what he saw. Because John saw the great throne of heaven, and on that throne he saw the Ancient of Days, the author and finisher of his faith, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, the great I Am. And John, who in one time in his life thought he had experienced everything there was to experience, saw God in all of his glory, and he was forever changed. It doesn't matter how close to God you think you are. It's not close enough. It's not close enough. God is inviting you today, come up higher, get a better look, know who I am. How well do you really know God? How well do you want to know him? Are you willing to say what the Apostle Paul said? Are you willing to face the challenges that are necessary to make you attentive enough and receptive enough to hear God's call to holiness? You see, this is where the sheep are separated from the goats. This is where the real and the holy are separated from the fake and the worldly. Can you make that kind of commitment? Are you willing and daring enough to count everything else in your life a loss and say to God, I want to know you more? If so, then I challenge you this morning to step forward and to kneel at this altar and to surrender yourself fully to God's will for your life. Give him absolutely everything you've got. Hold nothing back. Lay your all on the altar and be all in for Jesus. Father, I pray today for your anointing over this time of invitation. God, this is the moment where the harvest is reaped. God, this is the moment where some who've been standing on the edge, who've been contemplating a change in their life, who who know that there, there has to be something different than what they already have, God, have to, they have to step over the line. This morning, might they decide, I want to know you more. I want to see you in all of your glory. And God, I'm giving you absolutely everything I've got. So you can say to me, come up higher. Thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio. To find out more information about Free Christian Church of God, or to receive a copy of Reverend James Fry's weekly television program, Your Life, call the church office at area code 419-596-3103 or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.